So I'm a conservative. I think we all know that. I also like to think I'm a pretty well-read young man, not only on the issues, but on political philosophy in general, which sounds kind of cringe, but that's how it's classified. And so I get a lot of stress headaches when I see people who self-identify as conservative saying things that are not actually conservative. And so it just kind of goes to show how successful the left has been at infiltrating the culture and the media and the education system, because now they've actually managed to shift the Overton window of political discussion to where conservatives are defending liberal ideas while the left just becomes increasingly radical. And by the way, as we go through these, if you actually believe these things, like that's fine, that's your prerogative, but just know that these ideas are not conservative ideas. These are liberal ideas. And that's not said in an excluding way, like, ah, oh, you can't be in our club, you don't get to be a conservative. It's just like, we're conservatives, and the left has done a really good job of convincing us to believe in their old ideas so that we feel like we're defending something or that we're conserving something while they just keep marching the country down the field to the left. And in order for us to be effective as conservatives, we have to be defending and fighting for actually conservative ideas. And so I'll talk as well about how the left benefits from conservatives defending these ideas. It's going to be good content. We're all going to learn something, so do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, commie. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Commie. I've been very frustrated with President Trump and the state of the country recently, but then I checked my P.O. box yesterday and someone had sent me these very epic hats. It was very nice of them. I won't say their name because I don't want to dox them, uh, but if you're a real fan, you'll know what this is in reference to. I don't know if I'm ready to wear them quite yet, though. I'll just, I'll leave them here for now to symbolize that I still have faith in President Trump, but I kind of wish he'd get his act together a bit more right now. Also, it's my dad's birthday, so everyone has to be super nice to him in the comments, but you know why we're here. So we'll just get into it. What you'll find with a lot of these is that they're basically just abstractions. They're basically just ideas that sound nice or that would look good on a campaign rally poster. But when you actually like think about them and practically apply them to the real world, they don't hold. And so the first one is third wave feminism or modern feminism. We've heard this a million times before. All of us have. People say modern feminism's out of control. Modern feminism is about hating men. I'm an original feminist. That feminism was good. But it's the third wave feminism that's just out of control. And this is usually a mixture of someone that's trying to to extend an olive branch to the left to try to avoid getting ridiculed and getting demonized, which never works, by the way, and someone who just simply hasn't done their homework. And a lot of these are just people claiming to have problems with the logical and natural progression of things, whether it's feminism becoming what it is now or liberalism uh, becoming progressivism. So it's important to understand that if you're against what something is invariably going to evolve into, you de facto have to be against it in the first place. If you don't want the tree in your yard, then don't plant one, basically. There's really no such thing as like third wave or second wave feminism other than class on the timeline of what is the entirety of feminism, which is bad, uh, and was arguably one of the biggest political mistakes in the history of the world. And so what conservatives tend to do is we tend to look at the way these modern feminists behave. Maybe they're talking about our male privilege, or maybe they're trying to insert their agenda into our favorite video game. And so from there we say, okay, that's enough. Now we've gone too far. But that's just ignorance of history, because it assumes that everything before that was just a-okay. And these movements do not simply disperse once they've achieved their original goals. It just doesn't happen. They form new goals. They evolve. They become more radicalized. They become businesses, etc. And feminism purports itself to be about equality. But what that means isn't just that they should be treated the same as men. It means that the outcomes must be equal. These are liberal ideas, equality of outcome, egalitarianism. Those are liberal ideas. Feminism also denies the intuitive nature of men and women. That's blank slate theory taken to its logical conclusion. That's John Locke. That's liberalism. There's nothing conservative about feminism. It seeks to self-propagate into increasingly radical and progressive causes while championing itself as this like moral movement. But really, what new insight did it even bring to the table? That women are equal to men in dignity and intrinsic value? Christ did that, not feminism. It's been affirmed by Christian thinkers for centuries, long before 14-year-old girls were getting shirts in the mail from Amazon.com that say, feminism, the radical notion that women are people. It didn't invent that idea, nor does it seriously advocate for it. Feminism fundamentally believes that women are completely equal and identical to men in every way except for arbitrary physical differences. And because of this, any discrepancy between the two can be explained by male oppression and patriarchy. That's why if you read into the history of feminism, you'll find things like Elizabeth Stanton, one of the godmothers of feminism, saying that the Bible and the church have been the greatest stumbling blocks in the way of women's emancipation. You'll find Simone de Beauvoir, another pioneering feminist. And by the way, she's also the reason that we have gender theory now. So that's pretty epic. Thanks 
thanks a lot for that. But she did an interview with Betty Friedan, another pioneering feminist who wrote The Feminine Mystique, which, by the way, has been widely criticized and debunked. But anyway, Simone de Beauvoir said she doesn't believe that any woman should have the choice to stay at home. No woman should be authorized to stay at home to bring up her children. Society should be totally different. Women should not have that choice precisely because if there is such a choice, too many women will make that one. It is a way of forcing women in a certain direction. And she said that because feminism was never about liberating women. It can't be about that because if you give women the choice, they tend to embrace their feminine nature. But if you indoctrinate women from birth and you socially engineer them to fulfill your agenda, it produces a totally different outcome, which is what we're seeing happen now. Feminism, it's rooted in Marxist and Freudian theory. Like it frames wives as dependent on their husbands, which classifies the family as a power struggle. So it's not men and women working together for their families, but rather men versus women for their own self-interests. These women push for no-fault divorce. They wrote that women would have to be brave enough to leave their husbands and their children. They ushered in the sexual revolution and its consequences, which has been a disaster for the human race. That's the Freudian theory. They believe that the female sexuality was being repressed as a form of warfare against them. And if they could just liberate themselves and be sexually free, they'd finally have achieved autonomy. Oh, and by the way, as all of this happened, the levels of happiness in women have declined both absolutely and relative to men. So that didn't exactly go as planned. Uh, and then we've also got a collapsed family structure, record levels of out of wedlock births. Everyone's depressed and feels lonely. And we've slaughtered like 50 million children, which really that's the grand irony of this whole project of feminism. This whole project, which purports itself to be about advancing the value of women as human beings, when feminists are the only people in the country who deny the personhood of women by slaughtering them in the womb. And ironically, the modern backbone of feminism is the ability to liberate themselves from the defining characteristic of their womanhood, which is the ability to become pregnant and to give birth. The crown jewel of feminism is abortion, the ability to kill children. That tells you everything that you need to know about feminism. Because you can't socially engineer the female body to stop getting pregnant, but you can enable them to kill the child. It's absolutely disgusting. And on top of all of that, this idea that oh, women could never really be women until they could go spend 45 hours a week at a cubicle away from their children, or perhaps even avoid having children just to dedicate more time to the cubicle. It's like, is that what being a woman is? I'm insulted on behalf of all the great women that I know just at the prospect of that. Also, there's no such thing as women's rights, <laughs> as women's rights. Like rights are just rights. And if you have rights that are specifically afforded to a particular group, then those are just legal privileges. Uh, and on that note, women are the most socially and legally privileged creatures on the face of this planet. Feminism is cancer, and we shouldn't be waiting until stage three to start chemo, basically. So moving on, we've got, oh, liberalism's okay, but leftism is not. My problem is with leftists, but I like classical liberalism. The problem isn't liberalism, it's progressivism, all this you know, stuff. Same thing with feminism. Like it fails to recognize that these are the natural evolutionary cycles of these ideas. Liberalism's not okay. Classical liberalism is not okay. It's still liberalism. Liberalism is the reason the country's in the state that it's in. Liberalism is the reason that the left is becoming more radically left and the right is becoming more liberal. Liberalism failed. And it's not because we didn't execute it properly. It's because we did execute it properly. It's self-destructive. Liberalism sought to do away with the traditional aristocracy to bring about greater equality. Turns out that through doing that, we've created an even greater aristocracy with unimaginably greater wealth discrepancies and an elite class that controls and exploits us. And since it was done under the guise of equality, we're basically convinced that it's just and that it's fair, or at least they are. They don't see anything wrong with the system because it benefits them. Liberalism also sought to create a multicultural society of different beliefs while expanding liberty. But as it would turn out, you can't have a society with huge income inequality, no you unifying principle except that there is to be no unifying principle and manage to preserve the stability in that society necessary to maintain liberty. The government that we have now would be a historical tyrant's wet dream like, yes sir, turns out that all it takes to distract the people from the collapse of their society and the expansion of government as a result is mass market consumerism, World War II nostalgia, and fireworks. God bless America. It's like you don't even need martial law right off the bat. You just get your population to be fat, depressed, weak, addicted, godless, hedonistic degenerates, all in the name of freedom or whatever. And then when everything goes up in flames, they'll just be begging you to take their rights away for that security. The point of all this being that conservatives need to stop conserving liberal ideas for the left. We've been doing that for about 70 years now. Meanwhile, the left has been full sprint towards the left side of the spectrum. We need to stop seeding ground and actually like, you know, become conservative again. Liberal ideas lead to progressivism, socialism, cultural Marxism, etc. And a classical liberal will tell you that in order to achieve the actualization of selfhood, an individual must be totally free. So we run that experiment. Then it turns out that that causes rampant inequality. So then later liberals who became progressives thought that that level of inequality would prevent uh, people from actualizing selfhood. So they must now move towards a, a form of like economic equality, et cetera. Like, I mean, you could even do that with, uh, with the harm principle. Remember that one, John Stuart Mill? Libertarians will like this one. Most of you probably 
Well, because I'd estimate that you don't know the whole context. So um, the harm principle basically says that an individual can do whatever they want and they should only be stopped if they're going to harm someone else. And people take this and they assume that it's talking about limiting government. But if you actually read On Liberty, he opens that book by talking about how in England, the weight of the public opinion is actually more influential than the law. And what's the problem with that? Well, one day that public opinion, which is telling me I can't do this or I can't do this. Well, one day in a democratic society, that public opinion could become the law. And so the only way to compare Bat this was to reduce the effects of public opinion by waging a war on tradition and on the customs of a society. And so fast forward to now, we live in exactly that, that society. And that's the harm principle in full effect, because while you can be fired for having a harmful opinion or even fined for saying the wrong thing, you can tear down statues that represent our history, since at least that isn't directly doing harm to an individual. Turns out when you simultaneously create a multicultural society with no unification and collapse the family structure, it leads to this sort of tribalism between groups, which is encouraged by our politicians to consolidate power. And then since you've created a multifaceted power struggle, any wrongdoing can be considered to be harmful towards a particular group, thereby violating the harm principle and resulting in you facing social and even legal consequences. And by the way, the solution uh, moving forward isn't to try and get back to like square one of liberalism. We tend to look at how America used to be and we see its perpetual decline and we're wondering like, where do we go wrong here? Here's the kicker. That society was already in place. The social fabric, the institutions, it was preserved and passed down for generations. And then it took a couple generations of liberalism to erode it to its near collapse, which is where we are now. That society existed not because of liberalism, but despite liberalism, though it became increasingly weak as generations passed. And now here we are. So from there, I kind of want to get back generally to the harm principle because something that I hear from both the left and the people that think they're on the right is, well, if it doesn't affect you, you shouldn't care about it. It's none of your business what people do, etc. And so firstly, you can kind of see how the harm principle as a liberal principle has evolved or perhaps devolved into the progressive rendition, which is whether it affects you. And the reason that this happened is that to assert something like harm as bad would be to acknowledge that human beings have innate value, which is a conservative idea. And also the individual cannot achieve true autonomy unless he is free to harm himself and to harm other people, provided that they've consented. And so we've effectively replaced true objective morality with subjective consent-based morality, where the arbitration of whether it's right isn't whether it's indeed right, but whether the person has consented to it. So as conservatives, when we see things like babies being killed in the womb or children being given cross-sex hormones or people spending their lives and destroying themselves by using drugs or becoming addicted to pornography or video games or whatever, we care about them because we care about individuals and their well-being. And we actually, we do know what's best for people. And the liberals promote this idea of, well, how can you know what's best for people? Because it allows their worldview of anything goes to propagate. And as it would turn out, liberals don't actually care about other people out of the goodness of their hearts. Ultimately, what it comes down to is a form of radical individualism and selfishness that requires the formation of a like-minded coalition in order to maintain and facilitate that worldview. But things don't stop being right or wrong just because they don't affect you directly. And that being said, just because it doesn't affect you directly on the mic Macro scale doesn't mean that it won't affect you on the macro scale, on the societal scale. If you have a society filled with individuals doing things that are wrong, eventually that's going to get back to you because it's going to corrupt the moral fabric and destabilize the society, which is about where we are right now. And also this sort of gets into the idea of like, oh, well, an individual in the privacy of their own home. And it's like human nature knows no physical barriers. You are not two people. You are one person. And if you engage in immoral behavior in private, that's going to compromise you as an individual, which is going to affect how you behave in society and the decisions that you make. Maybe you can keep it contained, but eventually you're going to slip and it's going to affect someone directly. Because it turns out that in order to have a stable and moral society, you actually have to have stable and moral people in that society. And that should have been enforced by the institutions of that society. Those were all destroyed by liberalism. So now we're left with nothing. And unfortunately, the government's just going to continue filling the vacuum until we can figure something out. That's the problem. Maintaining the institutions required effort and responsibility on behalf of the citizens, but then it turns out that doing drugs and drinking and having casual sex and taking chemicals and getting mad at the church, all this hedonistic, carefree behavior turned out to be much more fun than maintaining society. And the institutions existed because the people in society wanted what was best for society, so it cultivated the virtue. The government just wants what's best for itself and for the elite, so it actively undermines our interests in order to maintain its power in collaboration with the elite. But anyways, moving on, <laughs> last one, just in time, because I can feel myself getting discouraged. We've got the conservative response to the left suppressing our speech online, which is, well, just make your own company, start your own YouTube, a private business can do whatever it wants to do. And it's like this conservative tendency to just paint these ideal images with words and just describe these abstractions that have no practical application in life. And it's like, no, dude, I'm not going to go make my own Facebook.com and neither are you. And if you don't recognize the importance of us being on these platforms where the conversation is happening, then you're either an idiot or or suicidal because if we self-isolate if we say well okay fine we'll just go express our views on our own platform they're gonna be like 
okay. And then we're in an echo chamber on a platform that basically exists just to talk about conservatism or whatever. And by doing that, we have yet again seeded ground in the culture war by willingly removing ourselves from the mainstream platforms on which the modern political dialogue is occurring. And I said this in the other video, and it's totally true, which is that principles that are inherently self-destructive aren't real principles. They're just suicide that looks better on a bumper sticker. And it's not regulating Twitter that's the issue. It's the fact that they, along with YouTube and Facebook and all these other platforms, they receive this quasi-federal subsidy in the form of legal protections under Section 230 of the CDA, which are protections given to platforms so they're not liable for what people say using their open platform because inexorably... When you have something like that, people are going to start saying weird stuff. But what these companies are doing instead is censoring dissenting political speech, which would mean that they are no longer qualifying for that immunity because they're operating as publishers at that point, not platforms. You try to bring this up and conservatives just start crying because anytime they hear the word government, they just start screeching. But even that aside, I'd be interested in exploring the idea of guaranteeing the First Amendment on social media. I can't really think of a reason why that would be a bad idea. Well, now, wait a minute, John, you're telling me you want the government to get involved and extend your rights? Don't you see how that could lead to conservatives having a fighting chance in the culture war? But John, is it really worth it if it makes life harder for Twitter.com? Yeah, here's the thing. If conservatives continue to lose in the culture war, you're going to get a bigger government than you could even fathom. You're going to get socialism and you're going to get your guns taken from you. And if you even try to stumble through the dark to grab your AR-15 when they no-knock raid your house at 4 a.m., you're going to get your face collapsed like a watermelon by some 24-year-old who is just following orders. And I'm sorry if this puts a damper on the fantasy of fighting back, but maybe that's really all it is. Just a fantasy. Like, we don't even want to fight back on social media but what, you're going to liberate your street from the ATF from the window of your master bedroom? The point is that these companies have become extraordinarily powerful. These companies are the new public square. And we're not talking about the government coming in and enforcing the First Amendment in a workplace environment. Please resist the temptation to screech about the slippery slope. We are simply talking about online platforms remaining free and open for everyone to be heard. And if that violates Google's right to become a privatized Orwellian ministry of truth, I'm honestly not going to lose a ton of sleep over it because here's the thing. Google's not going to lose sleep over you. These companies are hostile towards us and our beliefs. They censor us because they want their worldview to be purported to be the only correct and dominant worldview, and you will never take them down. You will never start your own company. Your options are basically to let them continue to walk all over us and completely shut us down until no one has ever even heard a conservative idea before, and it's not like they're going to hear one at school or in the media. And as the society becomes more dependent on technology and more integrated with these platforms for communication and discussion, if our ideas do not have a seat at the table for that discussion, then we are going to lose. It's that simple. And when we lose, we will never hold power again. We will never be represented in government again. We will have to align ourselves with whatever is the predominant right-wing party, which will probably just be a more liberal Republican party. And once we lose, everything that you're afraid of the government doing to you is going to happen anyway. So... We either use what little power and influence we still have in this country to maintain our front line on social media and on these platforms, whether that's by configuring the CDA, extending the First Amendment, etc., and we use that to push back in the modern political conversation, or we allow ourselves to be exiled by these overtly leftist companies, then we basically have no mainstream representation left and we will never win again. And these companies and the left, like, notice how all of a sudden they're these constitutional scholars. They're all for rights of the private business. You know why that is? It's because they know that they can crush you that way. If you refuse to bake a gay wedding cake, that's a problem. That's discrimination, even though it's this little cake shop. But these giant social media companies that have become the new public square, well, they're private businesses. Maybe you should just be less racist. I'm trying my best to hear alarms going off in my head at the prospect of being able to say what I want online without having it censored, but I hear absolutely nothing. The First Amendment exists to protect against the powerful government suppressing our speech. And the only way they could really do that nowadays is by targeting us through social media. But the social media companies are already targeting us. They're already doing the government's job for them in this night nightmare scenario of yours. And if you're going to try to allude to the Second Amendment, like, oh, well, but guns change just like speech, but that doesn't mean that we change the Second Amendment. And it's like, yeah, the Second Amendment says that we get to have guns, different guns come out, replace the older ones, change the culture. Yeah, guess what? We still get them. But these tech companies change the way we communicate and censor our speech, which will ultimately prevent us from ever taking our country back. And somehow expanding our right to speak freely will damage us in the long run. I don't get it. I'll I'll go read an explanation of it on some neocon website titled something like the conservative case for losing the country. (laughs) Being conservative means that you want to conserve society. So if your ideas facilitate the destruction of said society, they're not conservative. Hey guys, if you like this video really quick, hit it with a thumbs up, hit it with a comment, hit it with a subscribe, hit it with a turn on notifications to get notified when future videos are posted. And if you even want to hit it with a share it with your friends, that'd be pretty epic. Disclaimer, there is no, there's no button for that. You would actually have to actively... Uh, open a new tab or, or whatever form of communication you would like to employ and then you would manually have to go about sharing it with your friends and if you don't have friends it's okay um, 
you could share it with your dad for Father's Day. Do it. He'll love it. I'm sure he will. He's a real American man. But anyways, thank you so much for watching and may God bless America.